Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Legatum Institute, and thank you very much indeed for joining us. I'm Radomir Tarko, Managing Director of LI. We are delighted to welcome Matthew Elliott as President of the Jobs Foundation to speak in praise of business. Matthew is an inspiring friend doing vital work. He's also a modest person, so I'm going to embarrass him by mentioning his stellar past achievements. Among many other things, Matthew successfully ran the NOTA AV campaign that defended our tried and tested system of first past the post democracy. Later, he founded Vote Leave, the official leave campaign in our EU referendum. Matthew has changed history. Frankly, I struggle to think of any one of our generation who has done more for our democracy or for our freedoms. Vote Leave evolved from another organization called Business for Britain, because business was the engine of growth on which all our prosperity depended. It was true then, it remains so. The Legatum Institute exists for prosperity. In so many ways, that prosperity is fundamentally in the balance today. It is our belief that national prosperity will be defended and restored through a free society on the one hand and nationhood on the other. The successful model, pioneered especially by this country and the English-speaking world, includes a small state low taxes, free speech. It is also one of sovereign democratic nation states with functioning borders and the limited migration that maintains cohesion, as well as functioning families that allow values to be passed on, the young to become well-adjusted and productive members of society. We look for a post-Brexit settlement that will be a revolution in the true Burkean sense, to revolve, to return to the things that work. Business is one of those, or it can be. The extraordinary age of prosperity growth that Britain unleashed in the Industrial Revolution is now at stake. As some of the people who have worked here in the past once wrote, it risks being replaced by a system of crony capitalism. What is happening in the UK and Western countries today has even been compared to the early stages of East Germany. Private businesses do still exist, but they are increasingly becoming accessories to the state and its ideology. The CEO of one major airline recently asked people to take fewer flights for the sake of net zero. <laughs> when people begin to be debanked for their opinions, it's fair to say that our freedom, and therefore our prosperity itself, is at risk. But that great age of prosperity growth need not be, indeed must not be, at an end. I know the Jobs Foundation will remind us that all our prosperity depends on business being free to do business. I look forward to hearing your thoughts in Q&A after the lecture, but for now, please join me in welcoming Matthew Elliott. Thank you, Radhi, for that extremely kind introduction. And it's a pleasure to be back here at the Legatum Institute and wonderful to see so many friends and uh, fellow travellers here tonight. When I was invited to give this lecture, I did what any Gen Xer would do and Googled in praise of business. The top link was an article from 2007 from The Independent um, in praise of business lounges. <laughs> the second link was an, a 2016 article from the Financial Times on seven tips for getting more out of business travel. And the third was an article from The Spectator, and I thought, great, I'm going to be in luck here. I clicked on the link, I got an article 
in praise of minding your own business. <laughs> so this is a long way of saying woefully little has been written or said in praise of business. But even though this subject is academically ne neglected, it is, I believe, critical to our future prosperity as a country. I want to lay out a simple argument in five parts. First, that business is a powerful force for good, both in our society and across the world. And I sense, look around the room, you're probably with me on this one. Um, second, that business is viewed more negatively in Britain today than in other countries, and indeed more negatively than at any other time in our modern history. Third, that this anti-business feeling has been formed uh, by how companies and business leaders are presented in our educational, cultural, and political institutions. Fourthly, that this sentiment has, in turn, driven increasingly anti-business policy, damaging our economy and society in the process. And finally, fifthly, that this situation can be turned around by reconnecting people with business through an emotionally resonant, practical case for business that speaks to voters. So I come here this evening to praise business in part one, lament how business is currently viewed in part two, describe how it's come about in part three, explain how it's affected our prosperity in part four, and finally, in part five, tell you how we can turn this around. So let's begin by looking at what business has done for us. Many of you will remember the film Monty Python's Life of Brian, especially the scene where John Cleese, Michael Palin, and Eric Idle sit amongst a group of local tribesmen lamenting the Romans, asking each other, what have the Romans done for us? And slowly they realise that the Roman Empire has introduced all the great innovations of the day. The aqueduct, sewerage, roads, irrigation, medicine, education, public order, and so on. It was a cute and clever way to make the point that we can sometimes overlook the bleeding obvious. In this way, I believe unequivocally, but against the weight of public opinion, sadly, that business has had a profoundly positive impact on modern society. Since the earliest joint stock companies were formed at the turn of the 16th century, business has driven the development of seaborne trade, the Industrial Revolution, and mass production. More recently, we can thank business for the development of the telephone, the megaphone, the iPhone, the combustion engine, the search engine, a thousand life-saving medical breakthroughs, the to-go cappuccino, and the ability to watch 24-hour news and Premier League football anywhere around the world. It's the innovators and disruptors leading a business, delivering great products and services that drive the economy and, local, and social progress. It was the entrepreneur, Richard Arkwright, who spurred the Industrial Revolution in Britain when he invented the spinning frame in 1764, which mechanised cotton manufacturing. And I'm delighted that we've got in the audience today his uh, great, 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 great grandson with us today, Johnny Arkwright. Seventy years later, another Lancashire-born businessman, Richard Hornsby developed the first steam engines that went on to be used in tracks and trains. In the US, Thomas Edison, with financial support from John Pierpoint Morgan, set up the Edison Electric Light Company, which patented and commercialized lighting systems. One of Edison's oldest friends, Henry Ford, designed and manufactured the first mass-produced affordable motor vehicle vehicles. Air travel was pioneered by a group of visionary US entrepreneurs, including William Boeing. Half a century later, Freddie Laker took over the established airlines and turned air travel from a business luxury to an affordable option for tourists. And Martha Lane Fox then made international air travel even more affordable with lastminute.com. In the tech space, Bill Gates and Paul Allen changed the world by building software products that still dominate our PCs today. And here in the UK, Debbie Hassabis founded DeepMind in 2010, which was bought by Google in 2014, and is leading the way on AI. Where would we be had these individuals not had the bravery, tenacity, and drive to create products and services that have had such a positive impact on humanity? This is why I look at entrepreneurs today and marvel at what they have in store for us tomorrow. JCB is developing a hydrogen engine for their excavators, which will massively reduce the carbon footprint on building sites. Vodafone and Safaricom have created M-Pesa, expanding access to banking and money transfers for millions of people, opening up incredible opportunities for commerce across Africa. And OpenAI used a billion dollar investment from Microsoft 
to build ChatGDP, the first easy to use AI platform, which I promise you I didn't use to write this lecture. <laughs> These are just three examples of technology developed by entrepreneurs revolutionizing our lives. And this is what people most like about business, great products and services at reasonable prices. But my lecture this evening is not really about such headline-grabbing products. I want to talk about how business has been the biggest driver of global prosperity and social progress across history. We should never forget that the countries that spent the 20th century liberalizing their economies, allowing entrepreneurs to set up businesses and trade freely, prospered immeasurably more than the countries that did not. At the end of the Second World War, global economic power lay in the US and Western Europe. In per capita terms, East Asian countries were a fraction as wealthy as European countries. They were even poorer than South American, Caribbean, and some African countries. By the year 2000, the Japanese economy was larger than that of France and Germany. Between 1960 and 2000, China's GDP per capita had grown by 821%, and South Korea's by a whopping 1,554%. By 2010, the average East Asian economy was one-third richer than the economies of uh, South America, 70% richer than the petro-states of the Middle East and North Africa, and six times richer than the economies of Sub-Saharan Africa. So what explains this massive divergence in economic fortunes? What explains the explosion of growth in East and Southeast Asian economies, allowing them to catch up with their Western counterparts? It was not linked to direct foreign assistance or foreign aid, nor was it the result of government interventions, the creation of the welfare state, or the proliferation of trade un unions. It was down to a set of basic economic and political conditions that allowed economies to grow. These conditions were stable government, control of the money supply, responsible financial management, the elimination of monopolies, and most importantly, a rules-based system that leaves economic decision-making to private individuals and enterprises free to engage in trade with each other and the rest of the world. In short, as the economic historian David Henson puts it, the primary direct impulse of economic pro progress comes from profit-related activities and initiatives on the part of business enterprises. The key to prosperity is therefore a conducive business environment. So having established in part one that business is a force for good, in part two let me turn to how British society perceives business today. After all, if business is such a force for good, surely it's viewed positively by the public. Despite the clear and overwhelming empirical evidence that businesses are essential to our prosperity and progress, they are counterintuitively unpopular. A deep dive into the market research we've done at the Jobs Foundation on how business is perceived in the UK is an entire other lecture in its own right, but a few highlights. Just 36% of the British public think that large businesses have a positive impact on, on the country, compared to 52% of Americans. 47% um, of Brits believe that entrepreneurs deserve to be rich, compared to 53% of Americans, and, much to my surprise, a healthy 66% of people in France. And again, Brits are less likely to say they trust business leaders than the Australians, the Germans, the Swedes, and the Spanish. But not only is the UK a national outlier, we're also less friendly towards the business community than we were in previous decades. In 1986, just 36% of respondents felt corporate profits were too high. By 2000, well before the global financial crisis, 6% of people thought profits were too high. In 1985, 39% of people felt the amount of tax that business paid was too high, compared to 7% who thought it, was, thought it was too low. Fast forward by 40 years, the numbers are basically inverted, with 10% now saying that business tax is too high, and a chunk, chunky 49% believing they're too low. And most damningly, in 1986, 80% of Brits wanted to live in a free market system, whereas today, a massive 67% of people are open to the idea of living in a socialist economic system. So to put it mildly, the British public are sceptical about business and enterprise. How has this change in public opinion come about? This, this is the, the subject I'd like to explore in part three.
More research needs to be done on this topic. But my initial thesis is that these negative perceptions have been shaped by how business is presented in our educational, cultural, and political institutions. Anti-business influences begin with school-aged children. I was watching a relatively new movie called Clifford the Big Red Dog with my six-year-old daughter Lottie the other day. I was expecting an innocuous story about a big red dog, but what I got was an hour of propaganda, a story featuring an evil Silicon Valley billionaire and a kindly Chinese businessman, Mr. Yu, who's trying to save the world. <laughs> True. This one example illustrates how children are exposed to a negative portrayal of business from a young age, and it continues when they begin school. A poll of teachers in 2020 found widespread support for including global social justice issues in the national curriculum. They were reported to consider civil disobedience to be an appropriate part of the curriculum. To their credit, following reports of teachers preaching anti-business lessons to pupils, the Department for Education issued guidance to all state schools categorising anti-capitalist opinions as an extreme position and disallowed in the classroom. But it goes on. Now look at our higher education institutions. If you go to the blog of my alma mater, the London School of Economics, you'll find recent articles by academics on how the very rich are dysfunctional and unjust, how zero hours contracts are a modern form of slavery, and how the corruption of British politics is being done by business. Bristol University Press recently published a series of pamphlets on alternatives to capitalism in the 21st century. Or take the Oxford Union. In recent months, it's hosted the left-wing US Senator Bernie Sanders, two former porn stars on two separate occasions, an actress from Game of Thrones, the rapper Bugsy Malone, and TV celebrity Matt Hancock. <laughs> Good for them. I have no problem with any of these speakers, but the only notable entrepreneur invited to Oxford in recent months was one of the technologists behind Skype, talking about AI, not business. So it's a shame that students attending Oxford University hear more from porn stars than business stars. Cynicism towards the business, business is palpably evident in the media, even in the business sections, and it appears to be more evident in the UK than elsewhere. The other day I compared the business stories in the US and UK media. The FT was reporting Deloitte axing jobs and the FTX court case. The Times ran with stories about subdued cons consumer spending and how IHG was disappointing investors. Conversely, over in the US, the Wall Street Journal ran a story on how United Airlines was improving customer service for economy class passengers and how Procter & Gamble had achieved impressive results. And even the New York Times, hardly a bastion of pro-business sentiment, celebrated strong results at Netflix and ran a kind of victory to one of the pioneers of cable TV. Positive news stories are sprinkled across the page of the US business sections. This cannot be said in the UK. The Independent recently reported that Shell's, quote, obscene profits had hit a 115-year high. And an article in The Guardian described supermarkets as corporate wreckers making runaway profits. And for what it's worth, I don't recall ever seeing an article in the FT entitled In Praise of Business. Over at the BBC, they recently produced a podcast called Good Bad Billionaires, which finds out, finds out how the richest people on the planet made their billions and then judges them for it. I listened to a few episodes hoping that these billionaires would be judged on the, the products they'd invented or the jobs they'd created, but I didn't hear any of that. Put it like this, the series wasn't designed to encourage buddy entrepreneurs to follow their dreams. And whilst it's absolutely right that the likes of Sam Bankman Freed uh, of this world receive the proper scrutiny, if people only hear about the bad apples, they will soon conclude that the entire crop is rotten. But perhaps the British news media are just reflecting the wider scepticism and cynicism in popular culture. From the relatively innocuous Dragon's Den to Alan Sugar's Apprentice, business leads are conventionally portrayed as cutthroat, money-obsessed and amoral. So, many of our favorite block, so in many of our favourite blockbusters and movies and series, the villain is often big business. LexCorp in Superman, Skynet in The Terminator, Logan Roy in Succession, Gordon Gecko in Wall Street, 
and of course, Mr. Burns in The Simpsons, who's the ultimate corporate baddie. In fact, a number of years ago, a study on how business is presented on US television found that 40% of the fictional murders in films and dramas are committed by businessmen. <laughs> and I'm pretty certain that drug dealers and mafia bosses weren't counted in this number. So this, complete, this statistic is completely unmoored from reality. But it does, crucially, shape how ordinary people view business leaders in their everyday lives. Sometimes the negative characterization of business in popular culture is justified. I'm not here to defend the corporate super polluter PG&E in Erin Brockovich, but for every film about business baddies, where are the films in praise of business? <coughs> it's a free society. TV and film production companies are free to pick subjects they're choosing. So perhaps the moral of the story is that socialism sells. One group we can, and I will criticise, are our friends in Parliament and Whitehall. They are not chasing a profit. They are guardians of the economy and our prosperity. We're all familiar with politicians ruling business, and quite right too. Tony Blair's prawn cocktail offensive and George Osborne's habit of being photographed in high-vis hard hat are both emblematic of this. But if you dig deeper, feelings from ambivalence right through to resentment are visible. From Boris Johnson's infamous F business to John McDonnell arguing that inflation is simply a symptom of corporate greed. Or even Jeremy Hunt not mentioning business once in his speech of this year's Conservative Party Conference. All of these are examples of political leaders either directly criticising business or not using the platforms they have to explain why business is essential for our prosperity. In Parliament itself, there are currently 763 all-party parliamentary groups. There's an APPG on health, an APPG on education, even APPGs on cats, and to return to a theme at the beginning of this lecture, an APPG on business travel. But there isn't an APPG representing the business community as a whole. There are groups for rural businesses, hospitality businesses in Wales, and ethnic minority business owners, but not one for business as a whole. Or take a look at the work of the House of Commons Business and Trade Committee. Much of their work seems to involve shouting at and belittling businesses rather than championing their cause. For example, in June and July, they blamed supermarkets and forecourt operators for food and fuel price inflation. These are both issues that can be looked into, but they don't appear to have conducted an inquiry in recent years into, for example, how Britain is falling behind other countries in the ease of doing business, or how this is affecting our prosperity. There's a similar dearth of debate about entrepreneurship on the floor of the House of Commons. A search on Hansard Online suggests that the last time the government initiated a debate on support for businesses and entrepreneurs was almost five years ago. There have been other entrepreneurship-related debates in recent years, on government support for female entrepreneurs in October 2020, on female entrepreneurs in July 2022, on entrepreneurs from minority and ethnic, ethnic backgrounds in December 22. All of these are important issues, I'm not denying that, but they are narrow aspects of the business policy, not a big picture examination of the overall health of British business. Moving across the road from Parliament to Whitehall, the overall relationship between government and business can be described as chaotic, and dysfunctional at best. For example, there have been seven incarnations of the PM's Business Council over the past eight years. The Department for Business and Trade itself has also been through several incarnations in recent decades. Until this year, it was two entities, the Department for International Trade and the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Bayes, as it was called itself, was created in 2016 from the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills and the Department for Energy and Climate Change. BIS was formed in 2009 from the Department for Business, Enterprise and Regulatory Reform and the Department for Innovation, Universities and Skills. BUR was established in 2007 out of what had been the Department for Trade and Industry since 1970, which prior to that had been the, the Board of Trade. So when it comes to dealing with government, Business leaders should be forgiven for mixing up their DBTs, bases, bizzes, burrs, DTIs, and bots. 
I doubt there's any serious business in the UK which has gone through so many organisational changes in the same period of time. Similarly, since 2010, we've had nine business secretaries, 11 ministers for enterprise, markets and small business, and the equivalent of a different Minister of Trade every year for the past 13 years. From this organisational upheaval and churn of personnel, many business leaders have understandably concluded that Whitehall doesn't take its relationship with business particularly seriously. This is not a criticism of the number 10 business team, which is undoubtedly underpowered compared to our competitors. For example, a recent CPS report called Why Choose Business noted that the French government are far better at rolling out the red carpet for business leaders from around the world. We should follow suit here in the UK. And last week's Bletchley Part AI Summit and the second Global Investment Summit later this month are both welcome steps in this direction. But look at the overall architecture of Whitehall and how the civil service allocate personnel. It's notable, for example, that whilst the Foreign Office have roughly 73 members of staff in the British High Commission in South Africa, they have just one tech envoy in our consulate in Silicon Valley. With Google's market cap alone being more than four times the size of South Africa's economy, it's surely worth considering whether our country's external affairs personnel are being appointed with a more 19th century view of global, global power and influence rather than the needs of our country in the 21st century. But why does this general anti-business attitude in our educational system, our cultural system, and political institutions matter? What does this have to do with our country's prosperity and the ability of households up and down the country to put food on the table and keep warm at winter? This is the theme I want to explore in part four. As a bedtime story, I was reading one of Aesop's fables to my daughters the other night, the goose that laid the golden eggs. As you remember, the impatient and greedy countryman had the idea of getting all the golden eggs at once by killing the goose and cutting it open. But when the deed was done, not a single golden egg did he find, and his precious goose was dead. Ladies and gentlemen, I put it to you that as a society, we are at risk of killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. And that our elected representatives, being understandably close followers of public opinion, are going beyond just clipping the wings of our golden goose. They're already significantly injuring it. Taxation, a subject I began my career discussing, is a huge disincentive to enterprise. The total tax burden in the UK is the highest it's been since records began. As a percentage of GDP, it's been on an upward trajectory since 1993, when it was stood at 28% of GDP. This year, the Institute for Fiscal Studies forecasts it will reach 37% of GDP. Unsurprisingly, the latest International Tax Competitiveness Index, which ranks the 38 OECD countries on how pro-growth their tax systems are, suggests that the UK has dropped another three places from last year to reach 30th out of 38 in the rankings. As a society, we're clearly getting greedy about the number of golden eggs we wish to extract from the private sector. When it comes to regulation, you'll often hear how competitive Britain is as a place to do business. But that ignores the huge burdens which successive governments have placed on business in recent decades. A small business owner, for example, will probably have to appoint and pay for a lawyer, an accountant, a pensions administrator, an occupational health lead, a health and safety officer, and, I'm not making this up, a bereavement counsellor. A small business with just one employee may have to have an HR policy, disciplinary procedures, grievance procedures, file with the information commissioner, file with the local council for business rates, file with company's house, file with HMRC, set up a workplace pension scheme, take out employees' insurance, keep a record of invoices, statements, expenses, and staff contracts, write a health and safety policy, display health and safety notices, and finally, keep accident and, keep accident and incident reports. This is not to say that some of these regulations are not necessary, but we should recognize the burden they place on smaller businesses. Perhaps the starkest indicator of the increasing burdens on business is the exodus of wealth creators. UBS released a report this year 
which showed the number of millionaires living in Britain had declined between 2021 and 2022, from just under 3 million to just over 2.5 million. Forbes billionaires list shows that between 2010 and 2020, Britain saw a slower rate of growth in the number of billionaires than most of our competitors. By 2020, there were twice as many billionaires in Germany than Britain, nearly nine times as many in China, and 14 times as many in America. But this is not about the number of millionaires and billionaires. What's important is how this has affected ordinary people. Between 2010 and 2020, British GDP per capita actually declined by 1%. Yes, you heard that correctly. Our average citizen ended the last decade poorer than they began it. In contrast, Canadians were 3% wealthier, the Dutch 4% wealthier, Aussies 8% wealthier, the average Dane 9% wealthier, people in the US and Germany 10% wealthier, and Kiwis of a credible 11% wealthier. In 2021, the UK GDP per capita was roughly, in dollar terms, $45,000. The poorest state in the US was Mississippi, with a GDP per capita of approximately $46,000. It's quite shocking to consider that were Britain to be the 51st state of America, it would also be the poorest. Poor economic growth is a result of the UK's steadily declining business environment, which in turn is a product of our political environment, which is shaped by the public's overall attitude to business. So how can we do a better job of making the case of business? How can we turn this tide of public opinion? This is a theme I want to explore now in part five. The case for business can be made in all sorts of ways. For the more religious amongst us, um, there are deeper theological and cultural roots to our appreciation of business and enterprise. Judaism dictates that all wealth is held by God and our role on earth is to safeguard it through decent work and innovation. And the late great Rabbi Jonathan Sachs said that business and the market, market economy generally plays a moral role in the society by the virtue of the jobs they provide. Catholicism sees business as being one of the four pillars that uphold society alongside the church, the state and the family. And our last Methodist Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, nailed the necessity of enterprise when she reflected that no one would remember the Good Samaritan if he only had good intentions. He had money as well. And whilst Islam is perhaps better known for stipulating forbidden economic practices from charging interest to selling pork, it too has a strong foundational belief in the role of business. The Prophet Muhammad was, after all, a merchant, and the Hadith says the honest and trustworthy merchant, merchant will be with the prophets. For those of us who look at to philosophy more for guidance, an array of thinkers have espoused free enterprise, not just as a means of wealth creation, but also because it fosters relationships, fulfillment, and the good life. Adam Smith's theory of modern sentiments recognizes that economic relationships can lead to deep and meaningful personal relationships. For this reason, Smith correctly predicted that when countries trade together, conflicts become less likely. Smith led to David Ricardo, who leads on to the more contemporary works of Friedrich Hayek, whose road to serfdom argued against the excessive enroachment of government into both markets and our everyday lives. John Maynard Keynes, the father of progressive economic thinking, was glowing in his praise for Hayek's work, saying, morally and philosophically, I find myself in agreement with virtually the whole of it. But no matter how persuasive or not the works of Hayek or Keynes are to many people in this room, not to mention the works of the Torah, the New Testament, the Quran. I can tell you, during my 25 years of political campaigning, they ain't gonna, provide, ain't gonna persuade the public. We spent a good chunk of last year asking the public some deeper questions about their views on business, what they like, what they dislike, and what value they see businesses contributing to society. The big finding was that the British public are irritated by corporates who focus on social fads rather than providing great products and services at reasonable prices. We asked people what businesses should focus on. 42% of them want, want businesses to focus on the pricing of products. 34% want to prioritise the quality of products. Just 4% want companies to concentrate on their social purpose, and just 1% want them to campaign on social issues. 
Yet look at the websites of many business groups or the LinkedIn accounts of many corporates. The main impression you get is that they place more importance on the con their contribution to CSR, EDI, and ESG and see the fundamentals of their business as almost being an afterthought. From the same polling, what else do people want businesses to focus on? 31% value the role business plays in creating jobs. 30% value the tax they pay. And 22% value the training they provide for staff. This is why I would always encourage people to champion the role that businesses play in creating jobs, providing training, and funding public services. If this practical case of business is delivered using emotionally resonant ideas and memories, it reconnects business to people and persuasively demonstrates how business is a force for good. So to take each of these in turn very briefly, since January 2010, businesses have created 87% of the new jobs in the British economy. That is 3.4 million additional jobs in the economy. 3.4 million people who have an income, purpose, structure, a place to go, and a sense of self-worth. 3.4 million people who are now better able to put food on the table for their families, heat their homes, pay rent, water, and electricity. We also rely on businesses for training, for boosting meritocracy and social mobility. Look at the careers of <laughs> former M&S boss Stuart Rose, Preda Morger, CEO Pano Christou, or Mary Barra, the American CEO of General Motors. All of them started their careers at the company they went on to run. According to Sutton Trust, in 2015, the proportion of CEOs who were educated in the comprehensive system matched the percentage who were educated in the private system for the first time. Businesses therefore recognise that talent is not confined to the private schools and to Oxbridge. As well as creating jobs and training people, businesses are also responsible for paying the tax that funds our public services. Last year, UK companies paid some 67 billion in corporation tax. Companies are also on the hook, of course, for VAT, national insurance, uh, business rates, and an array of other duties, levies, and tariffs charged in different parts of the supply chains. In fact, PwC calculates that in 2022, corporation tax was just one third, one third of the total taxes borne by businesses, meaning their total tax burden was close, close to 201 billion last year. But of course, it doesn't end there. Businesses pay their employees' salaries, upon which income tax is paid. With roughly three and four jobs being in the private sector, then roughly three quarters of income tax take is generated by businesses, some 187 billion. And as for the 63 billion of income tax receipts coming from the public sector employees, don't forget that these jobs wouldn't exist were it not for the tax receipts from the private sector. So in reality, Aside from inheritance tax receipts on assets acquired by ancestors long, long ago, every pound of tax paid to the Exchequer originates thanks to the hard work of enterprise and a business leader. That's why a healthy public sector depends on a healthy private sector. On the priorities of business that matter to the public that I mentioned, creating jobs, providing training, funding public services, the business community have an extremely good story to tell. They just need to begin telling this story better in an emotionally resonant way that speaks to voters. And that's what we here at the Jobs Foundation are here to do. I want to bring this lecture to a close with a quote from Winston Churchill. Some people regard private enterprise as a predatory tiger to be shot. Others look on it as a cow they can milk. Not enough people see it as a healthy horse pulling a sturdy wagon. In saying this, Churchill neatly highlighted the lack of appreciation for business as being the engine which motes our economy or the goose that lays the golden eggs. One of my great privileges in my career has been meeting people from the business community. Entrepreneurs who built incredible companies that employ thousands of people in Britain and across the globe. Industrialists who have climbed the corporate ladder and now shepherd some of Britain's blue chip companies third-generation descendants who first worked on the shop floor and then took over the reins of their family business, and small business owners who are as much the cornerstones of their local community as the parish priest, the publican, or the policeman. I've never lost my sense of self of awe for someone who wakes up, goes to work, builds a business, creates jobs, 
whilst providing excellent service to their customers and helping their local community. This helped me realise early on in my life that business is a phenomenal force for good. I know that not everyone shares my enthusiasm for this, but I sincerely hope the Jobs Foundation will help reverse this wave of cynicism. Because the world needs it, our economy needs it, and the well-being of families depend on it. So I hope you'll join with me and the Jobs Foundation in making the case in praise of business. Thank you.